what was done to the Chicano nation and the way their language was literally beaten out of them. I mean, there's a whole history of that. I mean, they talk about, you know, when, when England was colonizing Wales, right? And you're going way back. I mean, you're talking, you know, long, long time ago. Uh, the way that they, they essentially tried to suppress the Welsh language is in the schools, they would have a thing called a Welsh knot. And it was a, a knot that you would wear around your neck. And if a teacher saw a student speaking Welsh, they would have to wear the knot around their neck. But then if, a, if this, that student saw another student speaking Welsh, they could put the knot around their neck. Um, and so whoever had the knot, the Welsh knot around their neck at the end of the day got a beating. So the idea was the kids were, you know, the kid with the knot really wants to get the knot off of his neck, so he's looking for any other kid who would speak Welsh. It was pretty, pretty horrendous. Um, you know, and that's done to nations historically. When nations are being oppressed, uh, the, the, the idea of, you know, of, of preventing the kids from speaking their language, it's kind of like what was done to Native Americans too, right? The Indian schools uh, that were notorious, where the Native Americans were taken uh, from their parents, forced to board at Indian schools, um, and, you know, I mean, the slogan that they used being, quote, kill the Indian, save the man, just horrendous stuff. And when you're trying to destroy, uh, when you're trying to destroy a nation, when you're trying to destroy a culture, you know, you keep kids from speaking their own language. Um, you know, I mean, you know, and Jonathan James is talking about how speaking in Gaelic was illegal in Scotland. Absolutely true. There's a whole history of that, not letting people speak their own language. And it was, it was because of this that the Bolsheviks, when they took power in the Soviet Union, one of the first things they did is start promoting the languages of oppressed nations within the Soviet Union, right? There would be no Ukrainian language if it were not for the Soviet Union. All of these Ukrainian separatists who want to hate on the Soviet Union, it was because of the Soviet Union, because the Soviet government went out of its way to promote the languages of oppressed nationalities in the former Tsarist Empire. It's because of them that there is a Ukrainian, there's a written language of Ukraine. They, the Soviet government bent over backwards to promote Ukrainian national identity, along with Georgian national identity, along with Belarusian national identity. Um, in fact, a lot of Russians criticize the Soviet Union because of this, because it bent over backwards to promote different nationalities within the USSR. In fact, in the early years of the USSR, they eventually got rid of it, but for a while, they had a house of nationalities, right? They had the Supreme Soviet, which was based on population, but in the government, they had a house of nationalities where every nation was promoted, right? Um, I know in the Soviet Union, they set up the Jewish Autonomous Region, the JAR, so that the Jewish people in the USSR who felt that Jews were a nation would have a territory of their own. Where and, and in fact, to this day, the largest menorah in the entire world is not in Israel. It's in the Jewish autonomous region uh, that once existed in the USSR. So, you know, the Soviet Union, they really bent over backwards to try and reverse these policies. And that was that was just a gross aspect of, of that era where, where nations are taking over other nations and the colonizing nation just tries to just destroy the language, destroy the culture, destroy the history. Uh, of the other nation. It's just a horrendous, horrendous thing. And I mean, Lyndon Johnson was doing it. I mean, the British, everybody. And the, so the Bolsheviks and the Soviet Union, I mean, Lenin was obsessed with the national question. That was one of his obsessions. And that was one of his key differences with Karl Marx. Marx said, all nationalism is inherently reactionary. Workers of the world unite, right? That was Karl Marx. But, uh, but Lenin said, no, there are oppressed nations and oppressor nations, and you should support an oppressed nation in fighting for its independence and fighting for its national liberation um, against an oppressor nation. That was a key aspect of Leninism and why Leninism was a break, a split from classical Marxism was because Leninism is about supporting oppressed nations, right? And, um, and a lot of Russians feel like they went overboard with it. Uh, they went too far with it. Um, and I would say the black nationalism as a movement, you know, it got a real kickstart because of the USSR. I mean, there was black nationalism prior to the USSR. I mean, they didn't invent it. But, but when they came out with the thesis, the black belt thesis of the Communist International that basically said that the descendants of slaves in the United States represented a colonized people within U.S. borders. And the Communist International called for the independence of the black belt they wanted to break away uh, the, the parts of the United States that were majority black at that time in the 1920s and 30s. And they wanted to create an independent black Soviet republic. People don't even know that was actually one of the demands of the Communist Party. That was part of their, their platform in the elections. They had election campaign posters 
on the slogan of independence for the black belt, you know, uh, self-determination for the African-American people, right? That was a big part of black, uh, of being a communist in the 1920s and 30s. It wasn't that you were just against racism. They were against racism. It was more than that. They were saying that black people are a nation and they have a right to their own national territory, right? There should be, you know, the right people, the black people have the right to separate from the United States and form their own country. That was a big part of communist ideology. Um, and and there, there are some criticisms there, right? The, the Communist Party was a majority white organization. And you have to admit, there were probably times where people, you know, if you have a group of white people going around and saying to black people, we want you all to be your own country, it sounds almost like segregation, right? So maybe it wasn't strategic, but a lot of black intellectuals and writers and thinkers associated with the Communist Party on the basis of their support for black nationalism, right? On the black belt thesis, Right, this idea that 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 black people constitute a colonized people—they're just like the Irish, they're just like the you know the people in the developing world who've been conquered by the French or the English. The black people are a colonized people within U.S. borders. That was a big belief of the Communist Party, and in fact, uh, Malcolm X's dad. Kinky's bringing up Malcolm X's dad. Now, Malcolm X's dad was, I believe, associated with Marcus Garvey and the Back to Africa movement, and he was killed, from what I understand, by the uh, by the Black Legion, which was a fascist group that operated in Detroit, um, and in Michigan. Um, and, you know, Marcus Garvey, you know, he was not a communist by, by any means. He, he very much, uh, you know, opposed communism. He, he was very much a, a, he believed in black capitalism and all that. But the Communist Party supported Marcus Garvey on some level. Um, they didn't support him all out, but they supported Marcus Garvey. There's a very good book you can read called Black Bolshevik, and it's written by Harry Haywood, who was one of the most prominent African-American leaders of the Communist Party of the United States during the 1930s. And he goes into great detail about how the Communist Party supported black nationalism. That was one of their main points. And a lot of black intellectuals started to support the Communist Party because of that, Langston Hughes being one of them. Um, Langston Hughes was a big supporter of the Communist Party. Uh, Paul Robeson uh, was a big supporter. Claudia Jones, who was a Caribbean-American activist who was eventually deported. Uh, she ended up living the rest of her life in Britain. She was deported from the USA because she was Caribbean-born, and she was a, a black activist in the USA who was a communist. They ended up kicking her out of the country. And it's weird because when Earl Browder, the the grandfather of a certain Bill Browder, uh, <clears throat> um, and uh, when Earl Browder came into leadership of the Communist Party, he didn't like the Black Belt thesis. He said, oh, no, oh, no, we, uh, we can't have that, right? We can't be for an independent black nation. We can't be supporting people like Malcolm X and the Nation of Islam and Marcus Garvey. That's too radical. So he dropped it. He dropped the Black Belt thesis, right? And after the Second World War, uh, Earl Browder was kicked out of the Communist Party, and William Z. Foster and, and a lot of the rank and file of the Communist Party rose up against Earl Browder and his corrupt political machine that had been, been really holding back the, the Communist Party and you know, really had them take some really awful positions during the Second World War. Like Earl Browder supported Japanese internment. You know, I mean, I don't know how any communist could support Japanese internment, but Earl Browder supported it, said it was necessary for the war effort. They basically sent a letter to all their black members and said, hey, uh, or all their Japanese members said, hey, comply with the internment, go to the internment camps. Uh, you know, that's pretty awful, right? I mean, the Communist Party during the Second World War, it was right to support the Second World War, a war against fascism, but Earl Browder's political machine that was really corrupt and really tied in with, with you know, the Democratic Party and, and all of that, they they really took supporting, supporting the Second World War to some pretty extreme lengths. And after the Second World War, a lot of the really dedicated communists in the party, like William Z. Foster, Elizabeth Gurley Flynn, uh, Claudia Jones, others, they rose up against Earl Browder. Um, you know, Earl Browder, they found an opening because Earl Browder hadn't, hadn't you know, supported the Cold War. He basically wanted to take the position that, 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 that U.S. imperialism was not the main enemy. Um, and Earl Browder was not willing to, to start, you know, opposing U.S. imperialism as the Cold War began. When the Soviet Union and the USA stopped being allies at the end of Second World War, uh, Earl Browder couldn't have it. He was not willing to take pro-Soviet positions in the Cold War. So when that happened, uh, William Z. Foster and Elizabeth Gurley Flynn and others, they created an opening, and they toppled Earl Browder from the leadership of the Communist Party USA. A very glorious moment, the anti-Browder campaign. And when that happened, one of the first things that they did was restore the Black Belt thesis and once again start supporting black nationalism. And you can read articles by Claudia Jones and others talking about how one of Earl Browder's biggest crimes 
was the fact that he didn't support black nationalism. Um, and it wasn't really until the death of Stalin and until the, the rise of Khrushchev that they ultimately dropped from the Communist Party platform the support for black nationalism. And the Communist Party switched its position and started supporting the civil rights movement and opposing black nationalism. That didn't happen until 1956, really. Um, and that was after the death of Stalin. It was with Khrushchev and there was a shift and, and the world was changing. And oddly, what's interesting is that Mao... And the Chinese Communist Party, when they were distinguishing themselves from the Soviets after the Sino-Soviet split, they started supporting black nationalism, right? And Mao, it's, it's not widely known today, but Mao actually welcomed um, uh, a, a very well-known black freedom fighter to, to China. Uh, Robert F. Williams was a leader of the NAACP in Monroe, North Carolina. Robert F. Williams. And Robert F. Williams, very famously, you know, he, he, got, he, he armed his local chapter, the NAACP. They were marching, protesting, demanding the integration of swimming pools. The Klan wasn't having it, was shooting at them and killing them. And he wrote a book called uh, Negroes with Guns, advocating the right of African Americans to armed self-defense. Um, and he got into a shootout with the Ku Klux Klan and he fled the country. And where did he go? To China to meet with Mao, with Mao Zedong. And the Chinese Communist Party put out a statement supporting black nationalism and supporting Robert F. Williams, uh, the leader of, of this NAACP group that took up arms to fight the Ku Klux Klan. Very fascinating. And, and again, that seemed to be one of the positions. When China and the Soviet Union were not getting along, one of the differences, we're talking the 60s, the Khrushchev era, one of the differences between the Maoists and the pro-Soviet parties was that the pro-Soviet U.S. Communist Party supported Martin Luther King um, and the civil rights movement, whereas the Maoists supported Malcolm X and they supported black nationalism. And there was a big difference there. It's very fascinating. This is all fascinating history. Um, I, I, I feel like a lot of this has been lost. That was one of the big differences. And that's why Mao was considered to be more revolutionary. The Maoists in China were supporting Malcolm X, and, and the Communist Party USA was supporting, you know, Dr. Martin Luther King. Uh, very fascinating stuff. I bet, you know, um, but, you know, I mean, it, it was it was very fascinating stuff. There's a lot of fascinating history there with how communists relate to the black question. Is it a national question? Is it a question simply of discrimination? Uh, very fascinating stuff. Um, now, I'm getting a lot of questions thrown at me. During the, the 1993 communist revolt, did the Yeltsin loyalist troops really gun down? I, I, I actually don't know enough about that, Tim. Um, now, uh, someone's pointing out that the SWP also supported Malcolm X, and that is absolutely true. Um, and in fact, from what I understand, the writings of Malcolm X, uh, like his actual writings, not the autobiography that was actually written by Alex Haley, right? And there's some weird stuff going on with that. That I mean, look into the history of that book that everyone's read it. I mean, well, not everyone's read it, but it's, it's available widely in the USA. Very widely available. The book, The Autobiography of Malcolm X as told to Alex Haley. It's not actually written by Malcolm X. It's written by Alex Haley, the guy who wrote Roots. Um, and it was edited by Harvey Braverman, uh, who was a, kind of a, a, a Trotskyist, and he was he worked for a publishing company. And from what we understand, I mean, it's, it's reported widely that the FBI was involved in editing that book and in editing the, the autobiography of Malcolm X, right? And that there, there's a lot of content that was cut out at the request of the FBI because the publishing company and Harvey Braverman and, and, and Alex Haley, they sat down with the FBI, and the FBI went over the autobiography of Malcolm X and cut out a bunch of stuff. And keep in mind... It's the autobiography of Malcolm X as told to Alex Haley. Alex Haley, the, the guy who wrote Roots, sat down with Malcolm X and did extensive interviews with Malcolm X, um, sat down with him, and then he wrote a book, right? So it's that's not the voice of Malcolm X you're hearing when you read that book. You're hearing the voice of Alex Haley. That book is everywhere. But the actual writings of Malcolm X, right, the writings, you know, the speeches of Malcolm X, you know, Malcolm X talks to young people, Malcolm X on black nationalism, that stuff, very interestingly, is the copyright of it is still owned by the Socialist Workers' Party. The Trotskyites, um, they actually own the rights to print it. Pathfinder Press, um, they are the ones that actually you know, have the rights to distribute it. They were sold the rights to Malcolm X's actual writings by uh, Malcolm X's widow, Betty Shabazz. So uh, very, very interesting history there. But yes, the, the SWP also supported Malcolm X to the point that uh, the SWP uh, even had Malcolm X as a speaker at their forums. He spoke at militant labor forums. Uh, that was forums sponsored by the Socialist Workers Party called the Militant Labor Forums. And there's a speech online you can listen to 
of Malcolm X speaking to a group of Trotskyites. It's very fascinating. Um, you know, a lot of fascinating history there. But yeah, the Communist Party USA, they did not like Malcolm X because he was a black nationalist. And they were, they were in favor of Martin Luther King, the civil rights movement. And the Trotskyites and the Maoists were supporters of black nationalism. Uh, the Communist Party had supported black nationalism during the time of Stalin. They'd gotten rid of it under Earl Browder, then they'd restored it uh, after the Second World War was over, and then after the death of Stalin and the rise of Khrushchev and the 1956 political crisis in the Communist Party, then they dropped their support for black nationalism. Very interesting. Um, another really good book to read would be Nelson Peary's autobiography, Black Radical, because he was in the Communist Party uh, when... Um, um, uh, he was in the Communist Party uh, when they had their uh, they had their split and the, over the question of the Black Belt. Just fascinating, fascinating stuff.